are listening to Hooked on Startups, where every week you'll hear from some of the most talented, inspiring, and successful entrepreneurs who share their real life stories, how they overcame challenges and failures, and how they mastered success. Get ready for some of the best business tips, tricks and tactics, and some frank, unscripted discussions. Here's your host, Matthew Sullivan. So I am joined today by none other than Lewis Ziskin. Lewis, welcome to Hooked on Startups. Hey, Matthew, thanks for having me. So we're sitting here, we're in your offices in LA, surrounded by some of the most amazing gizmos that I think I've ever seen. So in front of me, uh, there is this, uh, what can only be described as something out of the 23rd century, which is a... uh, (laughs) We have, it's a, uh, actually it's a DJI Mavic drone which uh, works with our platform. So Lewis runs a very interesting company which is called Dropin. And Dropin really is about to disrupt the insurance sector. When you say disrupt, I think that's what a lot of tech companies aim to do. That's not what we aim to do. A lot of tech companies, I think, get confused or they're misinformed where they think that their tech is a requirement. And they don't understand, especially as it relates to the insurance industry, insurance has been making money since there was an abacus. They don't need tech. They don't even need a calculator. It's, uh, you know, there's formulas that they use in actuary tables and they have a process and we don't try to change what they do. We just want to help them do what they do in a more efficient and streamlined manner. And We like to improve the bottom line and customer service at the same time, which is what makes our proposition unique. Let's talk about Dropin. Dropin is a video collaboration platform. It does several things. It allows uh, carriers to communicate interactively through a live stream with the insured, as well as with their field existing field adjuster assets. So they can simply send a text to any iOS or Android device Whoever clicks on that text will now have their camera open and they will begin to live stream to that desk agent, desk yes. adjuster or carrier, third party adjuster, whoever it is that has platform access. They're able to then say, okay, show me the water damage, show me the pipe, show me this. They're able to take full resolution photos and then they can also collaborate with the person holding the camera phone saying, hey, is there anything else that we didn't get that you want us to see? All of this data is then put in their dashboard. Their full resolution photos are put in there. We have a integrated uh, smart picture 3D into our platform. Andy Graff is their founder over there, uh, actually their CEO, and he's a great guy, and we just decided to do it. And now they're able to extract measurements from those full resolution photos as well. Uh, It's a fantastic service, and it saves time and money and creates handling, you know, basic, to medium complexity claims much easier. Let's take an example. So let's say that there's been a a huge tornado somewhere and there's a whole row of houses where the the roofs have been torn off. What would normally happen with insurance claims? So presumably the owner of the house would be on the phone saying, you know, my roof has been destroyed. Well, first we'd have to have the phone lines working for that exactly. to happen That's after right. a tornado. So assume, assume that the, uh, the phone guys have been in first. But, but what, what normally happens for an insurance company? Well, they, what, what would they normally need to do? So normally that's considered a cat, a cat event, cat, yes. catastrophic. And what happens is, is they send their trucks in there and they have coffee and phones and, and people come because in most cases the phone lines aren't working. Yes. Uh, most cases cellular data is not working. But in the case where it is, Before those trucks get in there, when those customers are calling in, the carrier is able to get uh, footage of the damage immediately. Yes. And if we happen to have drone pilots and connectivity at that time, they can get rooftop inspections because we actually live stream from drones. Um, We're not the only company that does it, but we're the only company that does it on a half second latency. So you can watch a drone live stream on Facebook Live or YouTube Live or Periscope or whatever, but what you're watching actually happened a minute to two minutes ago. Yep. What we have is five sec- half a second latency, a fifth, uh, yes. 0.5, and it allows the desk adjuster, wherever they are in the world, to direct that drone pilot hey, I need to see this. Hey, can you zoom up on that chiller? I need to get a picture of that serial number. And 
you know, that's what we're able to do for them. And that's amazing because I'm sure that, well, I know that there's an enormous amount of fraud that happens within the insurance sector with insurance claims. So this is something that, if you imagine an insurance company has not necessarily a large number of claims at once, but could have claims or does have claims all the time in all sorts of different areas. So normally what they do is they would send an assessor out. That assessor would get in his car, would spend you know X number of hours driving just to see maybe one or two appointments a day. So what your company does is you allow people to um, really be in two places or three places at once. Absolutely, or 10 places at once. And what we notice is that most people are good people or good actors at heart. Where fraud comes in is generally later on that night, they're telling their brother, their sister, their cousin, oh, this happened. And then they say, well, let's, let's include uh, the cabinets in this remodel, so to speak. It sure. now doesn't become a claim. It becomes a remodel in their minds. Or if you have an auto accident, let's damage some other stuff, pad the claim to cover the deductible. So if we're able to get these video at first notice of loss, yes. where people all they want to do is get it fixed. They haven't told anybody they've sprung a leak or they've just been in an accident and we get this video coverage where the insured is involved, then it's very difficult to pad those claims later to show damage that didn't exist at the time at first notice of loss. And also you say your technology allows other things to happen, things like measurements. So you, um, you have two key elements. One is the ability for someone to live stream from their phone. So someone who is not an adjuster can have your app and can go up and actually take pictures or can take instructions from the insurance company who would say something like, let's have another look at that, that right. piece of damage there and zoom in. Actually, what happens is, is the insurance company sends that person a text, either an adjuster who's on scene or the insured at first notice of loss or further on in the process if they want to see something again. And on there, the insurance carrier's interface, they tell the person, okay, hold steady, I'm going to take a picture. So the picture is taken actually by the adjuster. Brilliant. And then they actually can say after they've gotten what they need, they many times ask the customer, hey, is there anything besides what I've seen that you want specifically yes. to point out to me? And then they can take pictures of that. And the photos and videos are not stored on the customer or field adjuster's phone. The full resolution are up, photos are uploaded from the cache after the stream is over. And within a minute, it's available to that adjuster, uh, to that desk adjuster or carrier to start processing the claim and extracting measurements. So it's a bit like triage, effectively. Yes. So what you're doing is you don't, with most normal uh, cost adjust or uh, insurance adjustment, the, the adjuster doesn't really know what they're getting into. They get some kind of description from the client or the customer. And when they get there, then it could be something that they could have dealt with over the phone. So that's a huge waste of time for the adjuster. And money. Uh, of course, but but some of the guys that you're talking to, they must they must think that this is uh, uh, the the cure for their problems. I would have thought. Yeah, well, the problem, you know, the prob the other thing it does is it improves customer service. You can turn around a claim much faster, and in the insurance industry, renewal is everything. But the problem that we face, the number one hurdle that we face, is that uh, insurance companies have so many systems in place, and they're so profitable as is, right? Even when you bring them something new, like if I tell you, hey, we're gonna make a billion dollars, we're like, great, we stopped this recording right now and we're out to make this billion dollars. But when you tell an insurance company that, they look at it when you say, hey, I can save you a billion dollars, they look at what has to be put at risk to try and save that. So yes. it's a different mindset. And they have many pro uh, processes and systems in place, legacy systems, so to speak. Uh, and so I've taken drop-in away from that model. Yes. I've taken drop-in to, you need a login and a password and 10 minutes of training to use it. Yep. We don't need to be involved in your security, your API, the carrier's API can pick up the data from us every five seconds, five minutes, five hours. It's eminently usable, it's super simple. And yes, we're a tech company, and if you wanna integrate it after a few months and spend the money to do that, great, we'll do that for you. But in the meantime, if we're not willing to bet on ourselves, how can we ask you to bet on us? And I think the whole legacy system model is 
outdated because why would you ever want to put yourself in a position where you could only take advantage of Moore's law every 10 years? Yes. That just doesn't seem efficient to me anymore. And because insurance companies had been making money, they're slow to change those processes because they can afford to be deliberate. It's not that they don't recognize it or don't see it coming or don't want to be involved in it. In fact, many of them invest in the stuff even before they use it uh, in a venture arm. Um, I guess, I mean, because most insurance companies' normal answer to any question is no. Because of, you know, because of the risk that they manage and because, as you say, systems, security. But what you're saying really is that you're just providing an enhanced telephone call. Yes. In, in this very simple term. So if you can provide something as simple and as third party as a call with video that has security, that is manageable, does that open doors? Does yes. That's what that, that was. I changed the, the positioning of drop-in about six months ago. And I realized that a lot of men, women who'd worked in insurance companies for 20 years and are now shock callers or decision makers, they're being rewarded by the home office by saying, okay, thanks for the 20 years and we gave you a nice office and you have some power now, but hang the rest of your career on a startup success and a multi-million dollar integration and, and all this stuff. So I said, you know what, let's take the risk out of it. Exactly. There's no seat fee, there's no SaaS model, it costs you absolutely nothing to start using it. You pay if you use it, you don't use it, you don't pay, you don't like it, you get rid of, it's as simple as erasing a bookmark from your bookmark bar. Yes. And if you do love it, we, we're a tech company. We can certainly integrate. But I like to take that, that upfront cost and that, that contract and that obligation completely off the table because I want to make it easy for people to try it and use it. And I'm confident in our product that people will use it next month because of what we did for you this month. I don't need a contract to know that. Exactly. And I think that's the real challenge with any tech company or any tech, tech integration is that immediate feeling that this is going to disrupt all of our systems. It's going to be a lengthy integration. So what is your opening pitch to an insurance company? Actually, I don't pitch. I ask them to tell me about their internal processes and pain points. And because, like I said, we're not trying to change what they do. We're just trying to help them do what they do more efficiently. And sometimes, quite frankly, um, we can't help them because of the lines of insurance that they're in, and they appreciate the candor. Um, the ones we can help, we've gotten all, you know, they've told us about their processes, and then we can definitely help them better because we understand that we're, okay, we're putting a circle in a circle and a square in a square rather than trying to jam a star, you know, down somebody's throat. <laughs> we, if we know what they want, so I start all our calls, we listen. Yes. That's what we do. That's my pitch is I listen. I don't tell them anything. I don't presume to tell them anything. I listen and then I tell them where our product fits in their existing workflow without disrupting anything. Where is their biggest pain point that you've come across? Their biggest pain point is existing systems and processes um, that they feel would be disrupted by new technology. And, you know, it's just like it's like a doctor, yeah. you, you know, you go for heart surgery, there's all kinds of, they have to anesthesiology, they have to monitor things. It's not as simple as cutting your heart open and fixing it, you'll yes. die. They yes. have to do 10 other things to make sure that that operation can happen, which is why I positioned it the way I did to remove those extra things or those variants from, that would normally be a blockage to it, use. It's almost like where, you have a phone call with someone who thinks they're about to go into heart surgery, but you're going to solve their problem with a couple of painkillers. Yeah. It's, it's that sort of, it's a lot easier. And you can see that that's one of the real challenges with any tech is that integration is the, the technology is solving a problem that doesn't really exist. But I think what you've clearly done is come from the other way around, which is to say there is a massive problem in insurance because of these outdated uh, processes. And the reason they're outdated is because of this fear of change and these insurance companies are huge machines. But the insurance sector is huge. I mean, what sort of... Well, they're, they're, they have a problem there with the field adjusters. The average field adjuster is 59 years old. Yeah. They're aging out at a three to one rate of how they're being replaced. So there is a need for tech and they recognize that to replace some of that workload that just 
the workforce simply isn't there. Yes. And it's not going to be there. And how do you attract younger people to this? And that's been an ancillary benefit for drop-in, actually, because younger people are drone pilots. They'd love to go out and get paid a hundred bucks, you know, in the afternoon, kind of like an Uber driver. I've got some extra time. Let me get out there. I'm a licensed drone pilot. I can fly commercially. I'll get out there and do that. And what that has allowed us to do is collect drone pilots worldwide who are licensed and insured. And we have an environment that, that carriers can order from. Yes. You know, they can put an address and they see a map and they approve, they see the copy of the license and, and insurance and they send them out and they get there and they start live streaming to them and they get their data. They can also, if they have an existing drone asset in the field, many carriers have their own drone pilot assets or they use third parties like DroneBase or Airware or, or, any, or Hire UAV Pro or, yes. or DroneHive. Um, Whatever they're doing with their analytics data on that drone, that's great. As long as they're flying a DJI drone, they can send a text the same way they do to a camera phone and see it live also. So we don't interfere with all that topographical mapping. All that stuff still happens. They're just live streaming what they see and the carrier can see exactly, make sure, hey, make sure you get this, make sure you get that, give me a little more coverage here. And they have the beautiful thing is while those companies are processing all that great data, drone ma uh, topographical maps and, and geographical stuff and measurements and everything else um, and densities. Um, they are, the carrier already has the video and the pictures to start processing the claim while they're waiting for that other data to be shipped in. The ancillary benefit to drop in is, is now we're getting ready to release our commercial product where if you download our app from the app store, you'll be able on your mobile device to order a drone anywhere in the world and, see, and direct the pilot the same way the insurance company does. And get afterwards, you'll get a summary of your, an email with a summary of your bill and also a link to your video that you can then download and share and do whatever you want. So it's gonna give the rest of the world access to this bird's eye view. And that's possible because of the pilots that we've aggregated. Now, I'm sitting here slight in slight stunned amazement. Um, I mean, obviously I've done a bit of research about drones, but first time I heard about drones was when my friend was filming his wedding about three years ago with, with this amazing device that took some incredibly high resolution pictures. Um, and then you read about Amazon dropping packages from the sky with drones and you go, yeah, come on, you know. But the reality is that there is an entire industry that is being built on, on drones and on robotics effectively that we just don't see. And, and you talk about Uber. But I think really what you're doing is you're plugging into the future of what a lot of businesses will suffer from, and that is being, you know, humans being replaced by robotics and processes. Yeah. Well, you, even, even now, before you get to that step, you have bankers. They finance a $300 million construction. They want to know what's happening because maybe they're in New York and the construction's in L.A. They want to know what's happening. They spend $2,800 to get a drone flight that they see the next week. Right now, while they're in the boardroom, they can send a text to that contractor through his camera phone or, or you know, for 15 bucks yeah. and see exactly and direct him around and see exactly what they want to see now. Or they can order a drone. It costs 100, 200 bucks, depending on travel and distance and all that. And they have it instantly. Yeah. And they have the answer to their questions. As far as the future, we've already written the code um, that will allow us to have drone bases, say, along the 405 freeway. Yes. And whenever there's an accident, right, or whenever there's a police call on the scanner, that drone will take off automatically, yes. fly over to that those GPS coordinates, and then notify, say, the police department, hey, I'm here, how do you want me to move around? And they could take control of it right there. If there's an accident on the 405, the drone will take off, fly right to that accident and notify all the insurance carriers, hey, I'm here, what do you need to see? Yes. Um, we can't use that now because that's illegal, but Dropin already has the code and is ready to do that. So you started off with something which is a, you find that there's a problem in a huge industry and the insurance sector is a, I can't remember how many hundreds of billions of dollars it is, but you know, it is not insignificant. They spend 60 billion a year adjusting claims, adjusting. 
That's not nothing to do with paying out. That's just figuring out how much or how little to pay out on claim in the United States alone. 60 billion. So if you take a tiny fraction of a percentage of that business, then you're plugging into something that where you deliver huge increases in efficiencies and cost savings and the ability for these companies to manage multiple claims at once with a very low overhead, with far increased reliability and uh, accuracy using, using this technology. And improve customer service. The customer at the end, if they don't buy the policy, then the insurance company has no business. So not only is improving the bottom line important, but improving customer service and getting that renewal rate is important. In fact, we're working on a new product right now for auto accidents, where people, when they get auto coverage, uh, they have the app for whoever their carrier is. And in there, it was a notification, hey, I was just in an accident. Yeah. It sends a uh, notification to their carrier. Their carrier then sends them a text using drop-in. Now, guess what? The carrier has eyes on scene before emergency services gets there. And how long does it take to, to scramble the, the jet pilots, the drone pilots? Well, the drone pilots, this is, this is different. What yes. I was talking about is the camera phone. Sure, of course, of course, if someone's there. It takes less than a minute. Yes. Now the insurance company has eyes on scene before emergency services gets there. The first savings is if they order the tow truck, it's $100 yes. versus emergency services ordering, it's 200 the car most likely will go to their preferred vendor garage. There is, it's gonna, you can't pad the claim to cover the deductible anymore because you have the property damage. Amazingly, because emergency services aren't there yet, not as many people are injured, so that helps yes. with the PI cases. The insured is incentivized to do this because now they're done, they go home, the rent-a-car is dropped off to them at home by their insurance company, and the next phone call they get is their car's ready. But they're even more incentivized to do this, why? because that data is worth a five to ten dollar premium discount of course now they don't get that money but that money is applied to a new insurance product that covers their deductible if they're at fault as long as they opt into this program it just means that if insurance companies can be more efficient they save money those cost savings are passed down to their customers exactly and the insurance companies that are forward thinking and adopt this technology have an advantage in a very busy marketplace. Yes. So that, they must be kicking your door down, I would have thought. Um, they're very interested. We get a lot of calls. We get a lot of traction. We're in various stages, you know, with customers, pilots, proof of concepts. Uh, you know, we're really working very hard on this auto product because it makes a lot of sense. There's a lot of other companies out there doing telematics you know, making apps of how fast you drive, what time you drive to get quotes. We're not interested in any of that. We don't do any telematics. What we do is the app goes on, the insurance carrier's apps on the customer phone. We put in a button that says, hey, I've just been in an accident. A lot of carriers already have that. But now using drop-in, the carrier can send that person back a text right away. And being able to control the scene remotely is worth a premium discount. As far as your previous question about how long does it take for a drone pilot to get there, um, that really depends on where you're asking the drone pilot to go. Currently, we have about 1,100 drone pilots scattered throughout the U.S. Obviously, there's a higher density in metropolitan areas yeah. than there is in you know, North Dakota, but we have some pilots there, and if you need something in North Dakota, you know, it might take a couple hours of travel time until they get there, but it's like Uber. You're watching them go, so you don't, you can be doing other stuff. You know, you, you don't have to sit there and watch this. And as soon as the person gets there, you know, he's there, and now he starts live streaming to you. You change out of whatever window you were on back to the drop-in window and, and handle your uh, drone flight. You're very nonchalant about this. I'm sitting here thinking, this is incredible. You know, I'm seeing a future of the, the sky sort of with, 10 layers deep with drone pilots. Um, and I think you must, what is it like when you've actually figured out that, okay, this business that you put together is immediately cash flow because it satisfies a real demand and there's a real need there and it's a solution that is immediately applicable. So, but, but my question is, at night, at three o'clock in the morning, do you not sit up thinking, hang on, I could, we could take over this sector, as you say, real estate, why do you need people to do drive-bys in real estate? Why do you need people, as you know, as you, you talk about the office block on the other side of the country? Yes. 
So I do. I have a million ideas. My staff has a million ideas. Um, you know, and we took a business decision. I took a business decision that I was going to bring drop in to revenue positive and then go to the capital markets when I could make an offering rather than a begging. Yes. And for scaling money to go into those other verticals. So we've stuck with insurance and our automotive dealership product, yes. which is actually a reversal of the workflow. Well, let's talk about that because we, did, we just talked about insurance. So um, automotive dealership. So let's say that I'm... You know, I want to buy a car today. I'm in, I'm in the mood. I'm on. I'm on the web. I'm looking through the various different websites. I see this car I like. Uh, it's half an hour's drive away. I don't really want to get in the car. How does? What, what can I do with drop-in? Well, with drop-in, we put a button on the dealer's website that lets you see this car live now. If you press that button, that drop-in button on our dealer partners, then the salesman at the dealership gets a phone call. Yeah. And it tells him, hey, I'm interested in the 2000 whatever. It, he sees exactly what car before he answers the phone that you're interested in. And he answers the phone. And you can see that that car is actually on the lot. Yeah. And see the sticker so that you know when you drive half an hour down there that they're not going to try to sell you something else, which is what most people hate about the automotive shopping process. Yes. You know, and, and auto dealerships, the, the technologically savvy ones that we work with that are more advanced, they understand customers are not being sold cars anymore. Yeah. Customers have so much data now. They, can, they shop 26 websites on average. Yes. They're in market for about 30 days. They come to buy a specific product. The day of come on down, I'll sell you something off the lot, that's kind of over. Yes. And also with repairs, because how often do you take your car in to have the windscreen cleaned? And you come out with a requirement for a new gearbox. Yes, so they can use our linking tool, the automotive dealerships, where they can create a link and they send you the estimate. And then there's a button that they put in the email, live estimate explanation. And if you click on that button, that service specialist is the only one that gets the call, not the sales pool. He sees who he's talking to because he built the link, including your name, your car, your VIN number. He says, oh, you're calling about the 2000 whatever. Let me walk you into the shop and show you. Yes, we thought you needed brake pads, but here, look, you actually do need rotors. I'm sorry to tell you. Now the customer can actually see it. The mistrust that's in the auto industry can be removed. And the real difference is because there are applications like Skype and Zoom and FaceTime, which do this, which is which do this, but have this ability where I can talk to you and I can, you know, through a video call. But the difference there is in order for me to contact you, you need to give me your personal information. Yeah. Who Are wants you... to give an auto dealer their personal information? Yeah, it's gonna... not even an auto <laughs> dealer, but let's say I'm buying something through eBay. Yeah. And I could be buying a $1,000 pair of loudspeakers, for example. And it could say that these are in perfect condition. Now, I'd like to go, I'd like to go and buy this, but what I don't want to do is give the guy my phone number because you have no idea where that's going to end up. So your app also, I guess, is applicable for private sellers. Yes. That's one of the verticals that we've chosen not to go after until we bring the auto and insurance profitable. And you know now we have a profitable business that's in the market to scale. The capital costs are significantly cheaper, and it allows us to maintain control of the business. And, and talking of control, so your technology, your the, the thing, is there something in this that you can protect? To yeah. stop people competing or, or, or copying what you're doing. You know, it's funny because at first when people would ask me that, potential investors, I would say, listen, I'm not going to bullshit you. We filed IP, but we're not getting anything because if you think that we're going to get past Facebook, Google, Twitter's armies of lawyers that file patents on every conceivable thing around live streaming, then, you know, we're not getting it if yeah. that's what you're betting on. So I, I like to be upfront with people. Um, but we actually did. <laughs> we got we got a couple of IPs allowed. Uh, you know, we create a unique identifier for video and and audio, and we put them together so that there's no latency. And that process, we were just allowed our IP. Can you patent the idea? Can you patent the idea of using live streaming for these types of um, services? Is no. That, so that's not possible, is it? Not but, possible. But, but so you have to dig into the tech and. And yeah, you have to. There has to be a process in the way that you use the technology that's patentable because we haven't created any new technology. All of this technology exists. 
Now we've created processes by which we use that that, and you know, we've augmented that by pulling down SDKs and APIs, and we have you know, the couple yes. things we've got patented is our process, right? But you know, listen, live streaming's been out there since uh, Netflix. Yeah, absolutely. We're not gonna patent that. I mean, it's just, <laughs> that's the basic, you know, it's a web RTC product. It's a basic yeah. thing. There's, there's no, it's actually Google owns it and lets you do whatever you want with it. Well, I mean, we can't patent that. I mean, uh, uh, VOIP has been around since, you know, dial in uh, internet. Yes. We, we can't patent that. It, the way we put them together and use them in our process, that's patent. But a lot of this is all about the execution. I mean, yes. it's great having these ideas, but uh, so you, there's an army of 1,100 um, uh, drone pilots um, or drop operators, I think you refer to them. So th I guess those guys, um, where is their business right now? So if, the, if you are an FAA qualified drone pilot, are you overwhelmed with business at the moment or are you sitting there really looking for stuff to do? Well, I think some of them are, are overwhelmed. You have some guys who work in the movies. You have some guys who are not overwhelmed. They might have a contract here and there, but they have you know, plenty of time off. And then you have other guys who might be busy, but they're doing stuff that they may or may not get paid for depending if somebody buys it. So what we're offering is, hey, in your downtime, you wanna make some money for sure? You accept this call? You're getting paid 60 bucks to accept. That's your initiation fee to stop what you're doing and start driving. And then you get a dollar a minute for travel and stream time. And that's, so, that's a lot more than you get from Uber. Yeah, so you're getting, well, you're an FAA pilot and you have no, insurance. No, but understood. You, yeah. yeah, but, but there's, a, there's almost like this sort of snowball effect where if you have an application that is viable for someone to actually spend the time and money to get certified to be able to fly a drone, I mean, there's a whole bunch of people out there, you know, these, uh, uh, you, you know, um, uh, pilots, these, uh, um, you know, model aircraft pilots and hundreds and thousands of people, I would have thought, um, who would see this as a viable way of making money in their spare time. So the more drone pilots you have, the bigger reach you have, which means the more viable all of these other ideas become. I would have to say that there hasn't been a single drone pilot that we've talked to that hasn't referred us to a friend yeah. or a company that they work for that brought us more drone pilots and I think on that's, a revenue that's, share scheme. That's the edge, isn't it? Yeah. It's, to, it's to get that distribution. Because they're excited about it. Oh my God, I've been waiting for someone to do this. And when they see that it actually works, you know, and we're gonna have a big announcement in a couple of weeks and announce that this is open to the public, yes. not just to carriers, where now there's gonna be even more demand for them, you know, and hopefully we'll uh, drive even more people to get their pilot's license, certification, part 107, and, uh, and insurance and be able to do this. Uh, because at $60 a, a shout and a dollar a minute, it's a, it's a viable business. Yeah, it's over $100 an hour. You know, which is which is you know serious, and also, have you been approached by any news agencies? Because if you've got this, let's say nationwide coverage, another vertical that we chose not to go after until we have money to properly scale. Because to go after a news agency, it sounds simple, but one thing I've learned in the last couple of years, I would need someone who's in that business, who has those connections, that would need to be on salary. Because just when you call people and tell them, "Hey, you work at Channel Four, you could use this." That's not how you get in. No, but there are, there are apps and um, um, organizations out there where you download an app, and if you're at a, an event, let's say a road accident, if you take the footage, you can sell it. So it's, there's this online, I'm sure you know this. Yeah, there's an online absolutely. Market. Fresco News is the Fresco same way. Fresco is exactly the Yeah, that's, that's oh, and that's a fabulous thing. There's a, another one called Parachute. There's... I mean, that's great. That's not what we do. We offer a peer-to-peer -peer control of a live camera, of course, whether yes. it's drone or, yes. or camera phone, and so that these professionals in the enterprise world of insurance can get exactly what they need and not rely on, for lack of a better term, a layman taking some pictures just because he's there. Yes. They, once those pictures, they're, they're done, they're uploaded, hey, they might be valuable and it's a great business idea, but for us, an insurance adjuster is going to say, I need you to zoom on that. Of course. I need you to move around here. Can you get me a picture of the VIN number? Can you do this? Can you get me the license plate? Can you, know, can you show me the people around that are walking around who might tomorrow say that I have, you know, they're paralyzed? Yes. You know, so those are the kinds of things. We give, we give you the ability to have eyes on scene instantly. And that's what our value prop is. 
Now you can decide how to handle it going forward, either using our tools or by using our tools you saw who you should send out there. Uh, forgive my enthusiasm. It's, uh, <laughs> I'm sitting here thinking, you know, once you've got that distribution, once you have the tech, once you have that ability to be in two places at once, then there, is, there are very few service industries that you couldn't apply this to. So that, I guess that's the yeah. real challenge is to remain laser focused, which is what you've been doing. Yeah, I, I kind of broke the rules in starting the auto product, but I just thought it was too good of an idea. The insurance sales cycle is very long and arduous. So auto dealerships, you know, there's some that are very tech savvy that just, you know, a, a guy by the name of Gene Cameron came and, you know, we were talking and, and we came up with this idea yes. and developed it. And he, uh, but before I decided to do it, I went down to the two car dealerships next to my house and yes. I lied to him. I said, Hey, I got this product. Would you guys be interested in beta testing it? And they were like, what? You're going to give me a virtual up? Oh my God, this is great. My service, I'm going to get up to upticks in tenths of an hour. I didn't know what the fuck they were saying. Yeah. <laughs> yes. But I was just shaking my head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess so. And they're like, great, great. Where do we sign up? But, I, but that's what, because the insurance, I mean, um, the, the auto sector is so incredibly competitive and it's built on metrics that you would never imagine. Yeah. You know, that all these things that they have to report to the manufacturers, it's crazy. Uh, you know, it's it's not based on the number of cars that they sold. It's based on the number of tires they've changed or, yeah. you know, the number of windscreen wipers they've sold in any month ending in R. Yeah. So we, well, we provide them. We're not a lead generation tool. We're an opportunity for a person who has already picked the car they're interested in to see that that car is actually on the lot. Yes. And we give the salesman an opportunity to engage with this customer and I don't talk percentages, but if your guys are good, you know what car they're interested already, yes. right? Then you can close them. Yes. If they're not good, you're not going to close them. You know, I mean, it's, it's that simple. The customer maintains their anonymity. There's some other great companies out there that I'm trying to create a partnership and work with, like Redcap, who will deliver a test drive to you. What better way, yes. Matthew, than you found the car that you want, you're super interested in it, you don't want to drive the 30 minutes, right? So you press the button, you see that the car's really on the lot, and it's really the price advertised. Yeah. And now the salesman says, hey, Matt, how would you like me to drop this off to you for a test drive? Absolutely. And it's much more you personal, because yeah. I'm talking to him face to face. You've got that, that connection. Yeah, you're still anonymous <laughs> yeah. until you decide not to be, right? They offer you a test drive, we'll have it dropped off to your home or office. And you know what else, Matt? Six months down the road when it's time for service, don't worry about coming in. You get home from work at seven o'clock. Great. We'll pick the car up at eight. What time do you have to leave for the office? Six in the morning. Yeah. We'll have it back at four in the morning. If there's anything other than warranty repairs, you'll have a notification by 10 o'clock at night for your approval or and, disapproval. And you're right. I mean, it's once you've got that customer relationship, then it's, then you can add these layers of service, which completely differentiates you from, you know, all of the other, you know, service providers. Yeah. Because nobody wants, the dealership model, people just have such anxiety over everything. Oh, I'm standing in line. I'm waiting for my car. This salesman is trying to sell me. We can take all the because friction it's, it's out a, of it. It's a big purchase. It should be fun. Yeah. And, Why shouldn't it be brought to your house? Absolutely. And I'm just thinking about virtual tours of, of houses, um, you know, through, through, through realtors. For a realtor to be able to say, I can give you a virtual tour of the house right now using this app so you don't have to get in the car you know, again, and drive through traffic. Absolutely. Um, usually, if you have a realtor, though, you're, they'll be able to do FaceTime with you, so there's not I said, a but need yeah, for I guess, that. Yeah, I guess. It's but like, you know where there is a need for it? For sale by owner. Yeah, okay. So the for sale by owner, they put the link up there wherever they're advertising on Redfin or wherever, and a potential, in, as long as they're willing to take an incoming call from a potential customer and walk them around the house, yes. that, again, it's, a, it's an engagement tool that allows you to develop a relationship with between uh, an asset and a purchaser. I think this is just the beginning, really, of, of where we're seeing technology really beginning to change the way that we do things. Um, and I mean, seismic changes. I mean, not just, not just little tweaks, but where you're replacing whole armies of people, whole divisions, whole genres with, um, uh, of, you know, with this, or, this, this type of tech. Or even enabling people to do better. It's not always replacing people. We're not going to replace 
the salesman at the car dealership. We're just helping him be more efficient. You've got a guy on your website. All of your digital spend is to get them to pick one car and get to what's called a vehicle detail page. Yes. Right? Why isn't there a link between that spend yes. and putting him right on the phone with your customer to answer his number yes. one question, which even before best price is, is the car on the lot? Yeah. These are data facts. Like everybody, even if you mention, you know, 70% of incoming calls to dealerships are the number one question is, is the car on the lot? All of your digital spend is to get people to a vehicle description page. Your highest converting to sale tool is an incoming customer phone call. Why are those three data facts not put together? Yes. And that's what we put together. And you know, this you, we've already talked about the service, but you know, it's just it, it's mind boggling. And yeah. and you're not replacing anybody. No. You know, you're just helping them be more efficient and make the customer feel better. But you know what? If you don't have the drop in button on your website, then guess what? They're going to continue that 26 website shopping process. So you spend all that money to get them there. Yeah. And you, they leave because all that chat text, live help, that gets engaged with about 1% of the time, 1% yeah. to 2% of the time. Our button gets hit 20% of the time when it's on a VDP page. 20% of VDP lands are hitting that button. How well you convert that, that's up to your sales force. We don't get involved in that. <laughs> <laughs> One bridge too far, yeah. yeah. We can... As long as we get proper button placement, you know, and uh, dealerships advertise, hey, you know, when you land on their homepage, check out any of our cars anonymously via live stream. Yeah. So that the customer knows what the button is when they get to the vehicle detail page. 20% hit. Now that chat window that follows your mouse all around the screen, yeah. that's 1% to 2%. Yeah. Crazy. When do you think people will be able to start getting involved with your company? When do you think you'll be able to bring third-party investors in? Um, I think by December we'll be clearly revenue positive on both sides of the house and I've already talked to several companies who are interested already. I just don't like the price of their money right now. Are you looking for a, a, a VC style deal or are you looking for a, an IPO do you think? Well because of my past VCs typically can't have anything to do with me being a convicted felon drug trafficker um, who spent 12 years in federal prison. They can't have anything to do with me. Yes. Um, they're but it's funny because I'm friends with all of them now and they love it. But they've all said the same thing. You're a revenue positive company, yeah. the discussion changes. You know? Yes. I mean, I talk to kids, I tell them, you know, like when I talk to kids now, um, you know, I tell them, look, I'm dealing with it's twice as hard for me yeah. as it would have been had I not done this. Yes. But I also don't tell them to take their dreams of success away, like go work in McDonald's. Yeah. I tell them there's an opportunity here in tech to make that kind of money where you don't have to look over your shoulder. And I think, I mean, because the real, from my perspective, the real struggle w with this sort of discussion here is, is you know, the challenge is where, where do I bring this, where, where do I bring this piece in? Um, because what you've done is such an enormous achievement, bearing in mind everything that was stacked against you. So to spend 12 years in, a, in, in prison, you come out and it's not, you, your life isn't made easier because of that, to put it mildly. Um, so what you've done to actually build this and to get it off the ground literally and metaphorically, um, I mean, there must have been some nights where you felt, hang on, this is, this is pretty difficult stuff. Well, I'm the kind of person, rather than blaming the past on hindering me, who's determined to succeed using the lessons of the past that have made me a better person. So I take responsibility for what I did. Nobody twisted my arm, I did it. Yes. So it's my responsibility to deal with it now and to make that more efficient, which is what we try to do. I have to take those lessons that I learned and assimilate them into my life. And if I don't, well, I don't know if I don't because I do. I don't think about if I don't because I just do. But and tell me a bit more about the work that you do with with you know underprivileged kids and uh, with uh, the the sort of people that you think uh, are likely to fall into these types of traps because they think it's impossible to get out or it's impossible to do these things. They see people like you as as the unattainable dream. Yeah. Well, the first thing I do, you know, when I talk to kids, whether it be family friends or neighbor friends who have troubled kids or 
you know, I, I just did Beverly Hills High Career Day. Um, you know, when people bring this up to me, I tell them, look, I got to a level in that business that you're not going to get to. And I can tell you that it was a mistake. Yeah. I was wrong. I had all those cars and all that money, but you know what? You can't drive them in prison. Yes. And all the people that you think are your friends are really not. And the hardest thing for someone who's intelligent is to recognize that they've made a mistake. And the hardest mistake to recognize is the biggest mistake. It was a complete life error miscalculation. My big shortcut was couldn't have been further from the truth. Yeah. But at the same time, I don't tell them that you shouldn't aspire to great things. Because here, look, I started the company when I was on parole. Yeah. I've been off parole for a year, and here we are, right on the cusp of, of all this great stuff. And you know what? It's more fun. Yes. I don't have to look over my shoulder. Yeah. It's not, there's nobody chasing me. There's actually, I can talk like I can talk with you about what it is I'm doing, I, which I love talking I, about. But I just think that's just, must be such a release to be able to say, because I, you know, I'm having problems with VCs because I'm a convicted felon. I spent 12 years in prison um, for being busted for the biggest ecstasy hall in American history. Yes, but the, the flip side of that is, is I've taken that and turned it to my advantage. Because, because you, now I've yeah. learned how the VC market world works. Yes. I've learned how the capital market works. And you know what? The flip side of it is, is I have a very good reputation for making money for my friends and family. Yes and not playing games with money. I don't take a salary now, haven't taken. Absolutely. Um, and so it was no problem to get the money that we needed and to get to where we are. And I've learned the game of the capital markets. So they actually did me a favor because everybody else who's at my stage of a startup that has a VC wishes they could get rid of them. Yes. So I won't go to the capital markets until we're revenue positive and I will make an offering yes. rather than a begging. And, and I think you're right. So it saved the tail from wagging the dog because yes. I can imagine the temptation is at an early stage to say, I have this idea, I've done a bit of testing. You raise money at an early stage. The VCs have you by the short and curlers, as it were, which makes your life a misery. But what you've done is be, been against all odds. I mean, really, is to build this thing where you are, you are revenue generating, you are you are cash flow positive in a few months' time. Yes. Um, and that's a, you know, that's a big number. This is not an insignificant number. Um, and you, you've built a business that is scalable to the point where we've been talking about, where, you, you, where the real issue is, the real challenge is, is to focus on the things that are achievable now because there is so much you can do with this technology. Yeah, and it's great. You know, I mean, we're, by December, we'll have been in business two and a half years and we'll be revenue positive. I don't think there's many tech companies that can make that claim. And it's also one of the things I point out to kids. I go, look at this, right? Look at this. Yeah. This two years worth of work, bringing in $57,000 last month, is much easier than walking the track for 12 years in prison or being shot or killed or, or, or looking over your shoulder. Yes. It's much easier. Yeah. And it's much more fun because that, you're free. But, but that's, I mean, that must be amazing to actually feel that you've gone through that. And you must be one of the very few people that people actually listen to. So when you're, I can just imagine when you get the, the, the people that stand up and talk and say, you know, say no, and people go, yada, yada. But p people must listen to you because you've been through that process. You've come out where, as I said, everything was stacked against you. It, it could have been impossible almost. Um, but you just drove through it. And you're now at the point where, where you are, a living example of how you can be successful if you get that space between your ears in the right place. Yeah, and I think what happens with us, what happened with me, and I think what happens with a lot of people is they start looking at the finish line and say they can't get there. I don't do that. When I had the idea, yes, there was all kinds of obstacles. Oh my God, you're past. Oh my God, this. Oh my God, that. You're not going to be able to do it. You don't have a tech background. You don't know anything about technology. Your past is going to be a hindrance. But you know what I could do? I could find a developer to start building it. And then we could debug it. And then we could get our first customer. We could make it usable. Yes. And guess what? Step by step, all those things seem to disappear. Because this is the other thing I tell kids. If you're one of the people that does things yes. rather than 
talking about things, you're going to be successful. Yes. And, and, it, and it, but you say this with the voice with authority. And, yeah. and that, that's the amazing thing. I've been there. Yes. And that's, and that's the, uh, um, the, the, you know, people want a sense of purpose. And, you know, the, I speak to a lot of people, and the one message that comes out more than anything else is the money doesn't really matter. Because when you have the money, then you're still searching for something. But to be in a position where you can honestly make a difference to people's lives, that, that must be very fulfilling. Yes, it's, it's, it's very fulfilling. I'm very happy to be part of something that, that generates revenue that also helps people rather than hurting people. Um, you know, we improve the bottom line for our customers while improving their customer service. You know, we help auto dealerships move more units um, and improve the customer experience. Like these are the things, and these are why these are kind of the first two things we went after. And what I look at in other verticals when we have team meetings is if they don't answer those questions, they go off the board. Yes. Right? Because I'm very conscious that drop in always has to do those two things. People might use it how they use it, but when we go after a vertical, yeah. that's, that's the criteria that we look for. Yes. Because as you said, there's so many, so why not pick the feel good ones? And I guess also, you know, 12 years is a long time to, to think about stuff and to, to figure out what's real and what isn't real. Um, and, you know, how far does bullshit really get you in business or in life? So, you know, what I certainly know from sitting here talking to you and, and meeting you before is there is no bullshit. You know, it is, um, it's, it's digital, it's pure and... Um, it's it's a, a fascinating experience sitting here talking with you. Yeah, I mean, it's it just I am what I am, you know, and and what I do is is what I do. Just like I was what I was before. I'm yeah. no longer that now because I've seen that. I've recognized that. I don't self delude myself into being able to blame anyone but myself, and I take responsibility for what it is I do every day, from the minute I wake up to where I finally lay my head at night and. And that's, for me, the only way to live. And I b really believe that that's what gives drop-in uh, its rapid success. There is a feeling of, um, of uh, inevitability about this. I don't, you know, for example, this morning I had a call. I don't hide from the fact, it, I was just yeah. finishing it as you came in. Yeah. I don't hide from the fact that we're a startup. I don't try to act like we're not a startup. And I do what I told you earlier. I say, hey, listen, yeah, we're a startup. Try it for 30 days, for yeah. free, on us. Go right ahead. You like it? You can start paying us next month. You like it six months from now, we'll integrate. Yes. So we embrace that, and that actually turns it into an opportunity to give somebody something to use for free, Absolutely. right? That's yeah. how we offset that. We're willing to bet on ourselves, and yeah. you know what? If you give us some advice, or you need a feature, or you need something, we're a startup. We can do that. We're not locked into anything. We're here to help you do what you do better, not change what it is you do. Yeah, and I tell you, I can feel the, you can, the, the, the enthusiasm, the excitement is, is palpable. Anyway, I have questions for you. Great. I have other questions, and uh, this is my questionnaire, which I borrowed from James Lipton of uh, Inside the Actors Studio, which I think he borrowed himself from um, this uh, French talk show host, Bernard Pivot. But anyway, the first question is, what is your favorite word? Yes. And what is your least favorite word? No. <laughs> these are easy. We're going to rattle through these. Yeah. <laughs> so, so what are you most excited about right now? Drop in. And what turns you off right now? Politics. And what sound or noise do you love? The sound of a woman in bed. And what sound or noise do you hate? The trash truck. <laughs> <laughs> what is your favorite curse word? Fuck. I'm a basic guy. Well, no, it's, 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 listen, it's an incredibly versatile word, actually. And what profession other than your own would you like to attempt? Astronaut. And what profession would you not like to attempt? Prison guard. <laughs> <laughs> I won't ask why. If heaven <laughs> exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? Hmm. Oh, Lewis, it looks like we got you a little early. If you'd like, I'll send you back. <laughs> <That's right. laughs>
Fantastic. Well, Lewis, it's been a huge pleasure. I can't thank you enough. Thanks, Matthew, for your time. I had a great time, as always, talking to you. Sure.